Okay. I'm Christina Davis, Director of the Program on U.S.-Japan Relations. I am very happy to have you joining me for a discussion with Stanford University Professor Yo Tsutsui, who is a leading expert and is going to guide our discussion about universal human rights in the nation state, looking at the perspective of Japan. It is a very important time to think about international human rights, and Japan is increasingly playing a leadership role in these conversations. For a long time, Japan has been a supporter of the international human rights regime, while at the same time balancing its own diplomatic, economic, and security interests. In this role, we've seen the Japanese government and civil society embracing concepts such as human security, which it is now marking 30 years since that important time when the UN Development Program introduced the concept of human security with Sadako Ogata of Bhutan, the late UN High Commissioner, serving as a co-chair of that Commission on Human Security. We routinely hear Japanese prime ministers speaking and endorsing these concepts and many specific policies to try and advance these goals. In addition, sustainable development goals coming out of the UN system are also actively endorsed by Japanese business groups and civil society. Prime ministers, including Prime Minister Kishida, have taken great attention to human rights issues. Now, others are skeptical that Japan has had challenges in resolving its own historical issues, which are, of course, one face of human rights. And Japan has been more reluctant to have its foreign aid conditioned on human rights and criticism of foreign governments' domestic policies. So it's a complex agenda. And today we're going to be hearing about the perspective from Professor Kyo Tsutsui, who I will introduce now. He is the Henry Tomoye Takahashi Professor of Sociology at Stanford University. He is the director of the Japan program of the Walter Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center. Today, he's going to be talking to us about his new book, Jinken Tokoka, which was published last year by Iwanami Shinsho in Japanese. And this book is really a remarkable look that both examines a broad perspective on the evolution of universal human rights and what is Japan's role, where it has gone from assimilating human rights to becoming a human rights power with its own diplomatic uh, contribution to be made. So we're very excited to hear about this latest book, but of course I also would be remiss not to mention his award-winning book, Rights Make Might, Global Human Rights and Minority Social Movements, thank you, which was published in 2018 from Oxford University Press and was given many awards. He has also co-edited several important books, including books on corporate social responsibility, a look at Japanese foreign policy in Southeast Asia, and he's written many articles in leading journals. Recently, his article in the American Journal of Sociology on human rights and minority activism in Japan became an award-winning article that is highly cited throughout the field. Not only is Professor Tsutsui a leader in theories about international society and human rights, he has also been developing innovative data with the Japan Barometer out of Stanford, which takes public opinion surveys. He's also been creating an index to look at how universities perform as human rights actors or um, communities. And so this is a really broad perspective about thinking about human rights. And I know we'll have a great presentation for about 30 minutes and then questions from the audience. Our event is co-sponsored by the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at the Kennedy School, and it is also part of our series on policy innovations, which is supported by the Japan Foundation. Please welcome me and please join me welcoming Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christina, for such a kind, kind introduction. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here uh, stamp, um, at Harvard, um, and uh, such an honor to be in this uh, forum. So I have a lot to say. It's a book, and I try to present in 30 minutes, so I'm going to dive right into it. Um, so this is a book. I originally wanted to publish a sort of a translation of that English book, 
uh, but I stupidly referred to a possibility of writing a um, original book. And of course, book publishers would love original <laughs> publications, so they wanted me to write this book. So I, uh, so this book, Human Rights and the State, um, is a uh, sort of culmination of all of my research, including that book, but also um, some of my articles that examine the uh, global expansion of human rights. So I'm going to start with, uh, actually I'll follow the uh, outline of the book quite um, uh, uh, literally and um, basically. And um, I try to finish the first part in 15 minutes and then talk about Japan uh, for about 15 minutes. All right, so when I talk about global human rights, when, uh, when the, the um, scholars talk about global human rights, uh, they are typically referring to, well, the title said universal human rights that emerged with the, uh, that was um, institutionalized with the uh, um, Declaration, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948. But there is a prehistory, and it's interesting to look at how uh, this idea of global human rights is different from whatever existed prior to that. Because throughout human history, any human society has some notion of uh, constraining uh, authorities' power, arbitrary power, um, or being nice to other people, uh, doing to others what you would like to be done by others, those kinds of ideas, human dignity, some sense of equality, justice, those things always existed. But global human rights that emerged since the end of uh, World War II is quite radically different from those pre-existing notions about protecting people and rights in two ways. Uh, one is that it is universal, that these fundamental rights apply to every human being just for being a human being, regardless of their race, gender, ethnicity, uh, religious affiliations or, or political orientations. But no matter your background, you're entitled to certain fundamental rights. That, that universality, which we take for granted today, is very different, very radically different from uh, what existed before. The second uh, core principle that separates global human rights from what existed before is, uh, is that, at least in theory, often not in practice, but at least in theory, human rights principles trump national sovereignty. So international community, again, in theory, can interfere with the internal affairs of sovereign states. And these are both very inconvenient principles for powers that be. So it's when you think about it, it's actually kind of surprising that, uh, how do I move to the next chart? So it's surprising that um, in the post-World War II era, uh, the powerful nation that actually allowed that to happen, to establish, to enshrine these treaties, yeah, okay. uh, these, uh, uh, these principles as the uh, backbone of international order. So I'm gonna look at how, this, how it happened one by one. The first core principle, universality. For that to happen, ideas about everybody being more or less equal, everybody deserving certain fundamental human rights um, had to be established. And that was a long process really taking place in a, uh, earnestly since uh, uh, 17th, 18th century. And here I'm gonna focus on the expansion of empathy to outgroups. Well, any human society, has some kind of uh, sense of uh, empathy toward uh, members of the in-group. We empathize with our family members, our community members. But beyond that, uh, it was not that easy for people to imagine that uh, people who are very different from people that you know, they've never seen before, people that believe in different religion, people that look different, that uh, people are in, who are in different uh, sort of uh, economic environment, different classes, it was not easy for humans to um, imagine that those people would feel the same pain and that there's something that needs to be done about those pains. 
So this expansion of empathy to output is an important component. It, you know, if that doesn't happen, then universal human rights, the idea that everybody deserves human rights would not have emerged. And a lot of scholars have examined different uh, ways in which those ideas uh, develop, empathy toward our groups develop. And Lynn Hunt, uh, in particular, looked at epistolary novels, novels that are written in the form of exchanges of letters. Uh, she made an argument that that was very important in expanding empathy toward art groups. And she talked about Enlightenment era novel, um, which depicted um, sort of um, uh, rags to riches, riches kind of stories about uh, or um, some uh, female um, workers, employees uh, who work at home at maze. Uh, they um, they walk through the ladder and they go up the social ladder and become part of the nobility or something like that, that kind of story. And in the process, a lot of those novels depicted the pains and sufferings of people who are not the reader's class. First of all, mostly women are protagonists, all these important characters, and they are of lower classes, and sometimes they are of different uh, faiths. Um, you know, Catholics, Protestants, divided was uh, pretty big at the time. So those kinds of um, bridging of uh, religion, sometimes race, ethnicity, classes, that was important in uh, making people understand how other people feel the same kind of pain and suffering. Okay. Now that's not a, it's a theory. Okay? It's not an empirically testable kind of hypothesis, but it's, it's, a, it's a very powerful argument, kind of interesting. And so that uh, was, according to Rin Han, that was an important uh, first step. And then there was also this idea of sanctity of human body and uh, anti-torture campaign that Voltaire, the Enlightenment thinker Voltaire, took up his cause. And he made the argument that I care about this issue because I'm a human being. So even torturing uh, people of different classes, people who believe in different religion, people who are even different race, of different race, um, you cannot torture somebody just because they are human. That idea emerged and spread, and anti-torture campaign was among the first human rights movement of the time. And then um, anti-slavery, or at least anti-slave trade treaties emerged. That uh, is uh, what Jenny Martinez, now our um, province at Stanford, um, legal historian wrote this, wrote this book about how the British Empire really put its weight, its military might, uh, on abolishing slave trade. And that was arguably the first international human rights treaty, a series of treaties that the British Empire um, signed, ratified with other powers that be of the time. And uh, the British Empire even uh, established an international court to prosecute violators of these, you know, these treaties. And that was also a very important component, uh, arguably the first international human rights treaty that um, left an important legacy. Again, this is about um, anti-slavery, part of anti-slavery campaign. So it was about people of different race, people who were very far uh, from their daily lives in Europe. And um, yeah, they were supposed to care about the plight of uh, those people. So that, uh, that was that. And then um, in the movement, what's interesting is that, uh, uh, especially during the anti-slavery campaign, some of the inconsistencies of the, the advocates emerged uh, problematic as, as problematic because when they're meeting, these anti-slave campaign people are meeting, um, and then at the meeting, women could not be seated at the same table. So here they are talking about how equality of people and dignity of people and all of that, and women cannot be seated in the same uh, status. That was problematic. And also there were some arguments about how uh, people who are liberated from slavery should have the same rights and voting rights and so on. But at the time, most women didn't have rights in most countries. So what about females, slave, or people who are emancipated from slavery who are female, what do we do? And then because other women don't have didn't have votes, so emancipated slave women 
do they have a vote? So there are all kinds of um, inconsistencies in these arguments about equality and justice on the one hand and women's rights. So that's actually uh, another impetus, not that's not the only one, but another impetus that gave rise to the women's rights movement. And there are a couple other movements that were kind of human rights see at the moment, rules of war, labor movement, um, and all these things percolated up to um, um, to Universal Human Rights, a Declaration of Human Rights later. And in the process, I uh, uh, some people argue that media were quite important in mobilizing empathy. And initially it was print media that reported on things that, that are happening pretty far away. And that also helped in um, make, uh, enabling people to understand what's happening out there and also imagine what the suffering might be for those who uh, uh, fell fell victim to human rights violations. Um, the print media and also painting was an important uh, visual medium. Uh, this uh, painting, which is a famous painting about the, uh, about a massacre that was um, that took place in the war uh, for Greek independence of Greece, and uh, it was a fight with Ottoman Empire. Mr. Uh, did this painting and it um, came back to Europe, and people were uh, alerted to the brutality of the war and uh, uh, perceived brutality of the Ottoman Empire at the time. Photojournalism, right? Um, fast forward to the 20th century, photojournalism played an important role. And this is a famous migrant woman um, photo that was part of the um, uh, campaign during the 1930s to mobilize support for the New Deal. And um, this is also another way of, uh, so you, you're looking at painting photos, you're looking at those visual images, and it's easier to, to invoke right, a sense of uh, empathy for people who are suffering. Okay. And also, um, there were some, in looking at the history of human rights, there's a lot of interesting unintended consequences, miscalculation by uh, a lot of powerful uh, people and governments. And uh, during World War II, the Allies framed the war as fight against fascism, against uh, uh, Germany and Japan. And uh, it was a fight for freedom and human rights to a certain extent. I think the language of freedom was used more, but um, it was uh, related to human rights. <sighs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm boring you with that. <laughs> my thought. Um, so that, <laughs> um, that was also an important um, um, you know, as Hippocratic as uh, that argument was, because uh, here, here they are fighting this war against fascism with the, the segregated military on the, the part of the United States and uh, um, unrepentant colonialism for European powers. Um, but it was important that they frame the argument that way. And in the San Francisco conference uh, that established the uh, uh, United, United Nations, the United States uh, government, the State Department, made a lot of effort into mobilizing civil society groups to participate in that conference because, you know, what happened with the League of Nations, right? The United States government wanted to, the president wanted to um, be a part of that, but uh, Congress didn't agree. So the United States did not be a part of the League of Nations and it did not want to repeat the same mistake when the United Nations were established. So, um, it made sure that public opinion favors the uh, participation in the United Nations. So that's why there were a lot of uh, civil society groups. Uh, and what happened as a consequence was that because there were a lot of civil society groups who care about human rights, women's rights, and so on, they actually ended up making that claim in the conference. And the, and the uh, elites had to listen to their claims. And, and that's one reason why human rights became an important component of the UN Charter and subsequently Universal Declaration. Okay, I don't want two slots. I'm going to go much quicker this time. So the second principle is in interference in international internal affairs. That is particularly inconvenient for powerful states because which what this means is that uh, if there's a serious violation of human rights, outside actors can actually interfere in domestic affairs, which was supposed to be very sacred. The sanctity of state sovereignty was a 
important component of international relations since uh, uh, 1648 was part of the treaty. Um, but that was also allowed, and, and it's again a lot, bunch of miscalculations by the state, but also uh, as a result of powerful mobilization by civil society groups. And in institutionalization of human rights, um, again, started with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948, and then the, some of the key treaties, International mm -hmm. Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So the two covenants took place in the 1960s, adopted in 1966, and turned into force in 1976. And um, subsequently, there are seven other treaties that are important, four, that are considered core treaties in the international community. And those, um, Treaty that enshrined human rights principles. Uh, uh, Roosevelt holding the Universal Declaration. Um, and initially, it was not seen as all that uh, impactful. It's a nice, flowery ideas out there, but you may not do anything. Um, and during the Cold War, a lot of countries ratified those treaties, especially those dictators and um, third world countries, they ratify those things. It's so much easier for them to ratify a treaty. If the United States ratifies the treaty, they have to go to Congress, get, get approved, and so on. Japan also takes it seriously, so it takes a lot of uh, legal steps to make sure that uh, treaty is in alliance with domestic, or domestic law is in alliance, alignment with uh, treaty. So that takes time, but dictators, they can just sign and ratify and they don't do anything. So a lot of those governments ratified these treaties in the 70s and 80s. Um, and they could do that because they knew that there were no consequences of ratifying these treaties. So they get criticized for domestic human rights violations by Amnesty International and so on. And they just ratify the treaty and say, here, see, we, we're committed. And they knew that they didn't, the treaties don't, didn't have consequences because it was during the Cold War. And their boss, whether it's the Soviet Union or the United States, was well, sure to protect them if it, you know, when it comes to some kind of international interference, some kind of UN action, sanctions right, against those uh, uh, countries. That was always, uh, uh, almost always um, prevented by the, the veto power that these uh, powerful countries had in the United Nations. So these uh, treaties, number of ratified uh, party states uh, increased. And um, eventually though, the Cold War ends, right? And then in the process, uh, a lot of these human rights in, uh, international non governmental organizations played an important role. But the Cold War ends, and all these empty promises piled up. And paradoxically, uh, during the Cold War, uh, even though there were empty commitments in terms of the status, in terms of the um, uh, legitimacy of human rights ideas, that got elevated. Because everybody says that, oh, human rights is a great thing, human rights is uh, to be protected. That ended up becoming an important um, international principle, uh, more powerful than ever before. And then the Cold War ends. And all these governments that ratify those treaties, they can't just turn back and say, well, we didn't really mean it when we signed those treaties. Right? And now there were, in the 90s, as the Cold War ended, there were a lot more international activities to prevent human rights violations. It was seen as a golden, very fleeting, but the golden era era of glory. So that that's a lot of miscalculations on the part of governments to uh, that allow uh, this in interference, at least in theory, of it um, um, in internal affairs by the international community to pre uh, protect and promote human rights. That became a part of an international principle. I'm, I'm not suggesting that it still happened every day and all the genocides are prevented by international community, you see that it's far from the truth. But uh, at least in theory, uh, those two principles were established. Now the next step in the scholarship of human rights, global human rights is to think about whether those, a lot of these uh, um, uh, institutions that were established on global human rights principles, did they, do they uh, do anything good? Have they had any impact? And there are two camps, whole, Camp, the despair camp. One camp says that yes, we have done, the international community has done a lot, and the uh, human situation is a lot better today than 67 years ago. The other camp is that, despair camp is that no, it's just uh, some nice sounding words in the document, and we still see uh, genocide taking place in 
throughout different places and kinds of humanity, not to mention uh, smaller human relations all over the world. So the world hasn't become any better because of these human rights institutions. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm more on the hope camp, but I hear what the despair camp has to say about um, the lack of enforcement in global human rights mechanisms. So typically, genocide is the most difficult thing to address for the international community. Uh, you know, we're having a hard time thinking about what is genocide, what is not. Ongoing debates in what's happening in Ukraine, Gaza, uh, Xinjiang, um, Rohingya, all, all these things, um, there's debates about whether it's genocide or not. And uh, the, United, the United Nations has often failed to stop genocide. Large scale violations is very, very difficult to stop because it takes large scale intervention to stop the large scale violation. So the upshot of all that is that there are cases where genocide was prevented by the United Nations, but there are more cases where the United Nations was powerless to stop genocide, Rwanda in 1994 being a prime example. But I have some hope because there have been a lot more smaller incremental improvements uh, via what's called naming and shaming mechanism. The United Nations works best, US, UN system works best when it comes to these processes. So treaties, when treaties get ratified, uh, the government has to report to the monitoring body of the treaty. And then it's a periodic thing. So every, depending on the treaty, every five years, every seven years, the government has to come back and report on the progress. And then they get homework for the next round, and then they come back. So in that iterative process, often there's small incremental slow. Slow, it takes a lot of time, but, but small incremental improvements do happen. Um, and in the process, it's important that these ideas about human rights spread, giving, empowering, especially oppressed people, okay, marginalized populations that felt powerless before, now feel like they have a weapon in their hands in the form of global human rights. That uh, what I call transformational movement actorhood, the sense that they can rise up and make changes, make improvements in their lives, in their life situation. That's a very important component of global human rights. Um, the fall of uh, uh, Argentinian 1970s, 80s, uh, uh, mothers who campaigned to, to, for the return of their children that, that were forcibly disappeared in Mexico by the government. Uh, another important component is that, that local enforcement takes some localization of human rights ideas. And this relates to Japan too, uh, the, what people call vernacularization of human rights principles. So human rights is often seen as a Western concept. So if the Western actors just go into non-Western context and tell them this is a way, this is a civilized way, you have to do the same thing, that doesn't play out so well. So some kind of vernacularization, sugarcoating the human rights principles with local cultures, local infuse that with local ideas, local cultures, and also get buy-ins from local leaders. That often facilitates implementation of those. Now to Japan. Okay. Um, there are two dimensions to this. First, in terms of domestic human rights issues in Japan, um, as Japan entered into global human rights uh, system in the late 1970s, and especially since the 80s, there's been a lot of changes. And while well, Japan hasn't had genocide since then, so we can't talk about that, but in terms of small incremental improvements, there have been a lot. Not in all areas and not on all issues, but there's enough to talk about. And minority activism, the book Rights Make Might, talks a lot about it, how Ainu, for instance, an indigenous people in Japan who was uh, uh, very close to being assimilated and kind of eliminated from history before the 1970s, started getting exposed to international human rights ideas, especially indigenous rights ideas, and started mobilizing, taking advantage of the international human rights system, appealing to the UN uh, monitoring bodies of human rights treaties, and achieved some significant successes. I mean, it's now recognized as an indigenous people, the government, Japanese government, which often holds that Japan is a homogeneous nation, or semi-homogeneous nation, expends money, government budget, to protect and promote this culture that is distinct 
from the mainstream Japanese culture. That's very modern. So there have been some success. Women's rights and gender violence. Here, uh, recently, there was a lot of talk of uh, Chinese um, with talent agency uh, run by Johnny Kitagawa, who I think people knew that he was a pedophile who uh, took advantage of his power. His his company is really, really was a powerful talent agent talent agency that controlled Japanese media. And uh, even though people knew about this violation, they kind of they just turned blind eyes to this for decades. By the 90s, 80s, there was an a expose of what he was doing. Um, but recently, I heard about this a couple of years, uh, there was a BBC documentary that revealed this issue again. And, and the United Nations human rights uh, officials came to interview those victims. And that produced a lot of changes. It, it, it helped that the, the violator was dead by that. Well, it didn't help in terms of addressing the injustice, but it, it helped in making changes. Uh, but so, so the whole thing really blew up. And um, I could say there's some improvement. On women's rights, I have a lot to say, but. Uh, um, uh, Christina alluded to the Stanford Japan Barometer. Just today, there's Asahi, Asahi newspaper. Asahi just re, uh, released this uh, article on what we did. Uh, this is uh, something I did with Charles Crabtree, my colleague at Dartmouth, um, looking at how women's advancement in Japan could be achieved and what the public wants. And the gist of it is that the public really wants more female um, Diet members, more female um, executives in corporations. It's just the system is not functioning to realize what the public wants. So anyway, so women's rights in general, there's some improvement, in, not in all areas, but uh, there's some hope. Uh, Japan is notorious for not taking outsiders in, refugees and immigrants. And there was a recent incident of Sri Lankan immigrant who um, basically killed in the system of uh, um, immigration. So there's a lot to be done. This is a particularly weak area for Japan, refugees and immigrants. Um, you can skip this. Well, the, the whole point is that, the main point I want to make is that external pressures are often quite important. People, marginalized populations rising up is important, but external health often wants changes in Japan. The second dimension is that um, human rights, um, yeah, Japan's foreign policy, how that, how the government dealt with human rights outside of Japan. And in 1919, uh, there was this important conference at, at the end of World War I, and Japan was a powerful nation. And Japan was the first country to promote anti-racism in this conference. Some Japanese often, elites often probably talk about it. Um, and the motivation for this uh, claim to establish anti-racism in the uh, Paris Peace Conference was there were different motivations, right? But however Hippocratic it may sound, it was important. It may have sounded it was important that this claim was made, and it's a good legacy for Japan to have. But since then, well, Japan went into destructive war, invaded Asia, and so on. But after World War II. Um, it committed to human rights movement and contributed a lot to international rights institutions, for instance, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, because neither the US or China are party to it. Japan is the biggest contributor, budgetary contributor to the International Criminal Court. Uh, and in dealing with violating governments, this is a kind of a controversial point Japan needs to improve on. Japan often uh, takes the position of engagement. So if there's a military government in Myanmar, who the Thai established its uh, new government in Thailand. Japan tends to engage and makes the argument that it's a different approach than the United States or other European countries. We just believe in engagement. Um, it, it's difficult to judge this. Um, there's probably some arguments to be made for it, but more arguments to be made against it. And what's interesting about recent uh, engagement with Japanese government's engage, foreign policy engagement with human rights is that there was a turn to values diplomacy, Kachikan Daiko, especially since the Abe, second Abe, uh, which I think is very important. 
Um, and it's often seen, and it's probably true, that um, that it was used to counter China's rise because a lot of the value uh, diplomacy were about criticizing human rights violations by China or North Korea. But my argument is that it's good, even if government's commitment is hypocritic, it often um, ties government hands in moving in the direction of protection of human rights. So since Abe committed to you know, value diplomacy and started talking about human rights, criticizing China's violation, these kind of boomerang, recent boomerang back to domestic politics. So Abe had to, Abe government had to pass some laws against hate speech to protect um, Rakhmi from discrimination and also a new law on I. And there's, it's debatable how these laws, uh, how powerful these laws are, but the fact is there are those laws for minority rights that did not exist in Japan before. So commitment, Hippocratic commitment actually produces some positive results. And um, I think in the era of the rise of populism, populism authoritarianism in many countries, including Western democracies, uh, Japan has an important role to play in protecting the international liberal order, which is you know, collapsed. Um, and Japan has been a follower of international human rights norms in the past. Now it might be poised, if people put more efforts into it, might be poised to um, become a, a rule maker, norm entrepreneur, establishing new uh, human rights norms that other countries might follow. And I, would, I want to discuss what that might be, but uh, I think I talked too much, so I'm going to end here. Thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. You covered a lot of ideas yeah. and policies, and I am really excited to go on now to questions. We will lead off with Hiroki Taya, who is a professional from the National Police Agency here with us at the program in U.S.-Japan relations this year as an associate. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, today, uh, there, I think that there are some backlashes in the U.S. or, the, or Europe uh, policy that, again, the policy carried out in the name of the human rights, especially uh, the treatment of immigrants uh, in some, uh, sometimes divide the nations. Uh, even people in liberal democratic country uh, <coughs> cannot uh, cannot stand this interfe interference with sovereignty. So my question is, how should we deal with the contradiction, contradiction that human rights, uh, which should make our life happy, uh, can, uh, can make some people uncomfortable or unhappy? This is my question. Okay, great, thank you. So, uh, immigration. The issue of, of immigration is, uh, uh, well, this country has been having a lot of difficulties in dealing with it. Uh, in the United Nations, I said there are nine core human rights treaties, and they are core human rights treaties because they have monitoring bodies, uh, study with the two international conferences that I alluded to. And then there are seven other treaties that are specific to certain rights, children's rights, women's rights, the rights of the disabled, and so on. And the treaty with the least amount of um, ratifications is the Treaty of Migrants' Rights, Migrants and Migrant Families' Rights. This is the treaty. All the other treaties have at least three. Well, the Forced Disappearance Treaty is newer, so it's also in the 60s something. But uh, most of the treaties have 150, 180 kind of number of countries signing on, whereas this uh, migrant treaty has, I don't know, 58, 50 plus countries ratifying. And even the um, countries that we think of as most advanced uh, in human rights that have ratified all the other treaties, like Scandinavian countries, not Western European countries, even they have not ratified this particular treaty. Because and, and all the most of the governments that have ratified this migrant rights treaties is a sending migrant sending countries. So any country that are on the receiving end 
they don't particularly want to commit to protecting migrants and, and also migrant families. Um, so immigration is a is a very challenging topic that I would say there's not a strong consensus around, and even in the international community. Well, that's largely because these Western nations, right, do not are not not just the United States, but a lot of European countries are not particularly eager to take any immigrants that would come their way. And you see that in countries like Sweden was making an argument about how immigration immigrant rights are important and we should take any immigrants that come. Once the <laughs> flood of immigrants came to their country, right, in any countries in Europe have populist parties rising, uh, railing against immigration, especially coming from different cultural backgrounds, right? This is, right um, so, so this is a, a, a topic that I, I don't have a great answer to how to solve it, <laughs> especially in this country. Um, and some people actually are beginning to argue that there's maybe some wisdom in the way Japan has dealt with immigration, which is to not take too many. <laughs> in the future. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, seriously, there, there is, Japan is still trying to um, accept more immigrants. And this, this trainee program and all that, it's always kind of very clumsily built and not very effective. Um, but um, I think Japan is advantaged because it's kind of an island secluded nation. Um, whereas like the United States, it's really hard <laughs> to prevent people from coming in. Um, so, so the way Japan has dealt with immigration, which had been roundly criticized, Right, by most Western democracies, I don't hear as much of that, right? Because other countries are dealing with the same issue. Um, and, and, and so your, your question is about why there's backrush. Right? And so there's backrush because of the way the uh, debate has been framed. It's just <laughs> that uh, uh, these are um, oppressed, marginalized people that are coming from outside. So we should take them in which was more acceptable when the country, like the United States, when the country had more of a leeway for that, right? Yo you in Japanese. So if, if there's enough resources to go around, it was okay. But with uh, especially like the Rust Belt areas and all that, so the, 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 the factories leaving town, working class is suffering economically. Then a lot of people begin to wonder, like why do we have to take people from outside and then Spend our precious resources on them when our lives, our rights, should be protected. So, in some ways, it's also a reflection of so empowering capacity of the human rights. So, I wouldn't completely dismiss these claims by people who are making this backlash that they're making the argument that they, their rights are violated. Right? I mean, they have been traditionally in a more, more um, um, advantaged positions, so people tend to have less sympathy for them. But I think people, are, elites are beginning to hear more from them, more about their claims. That in, in itself is not a particularly bad thing. It's just when it goes in the direction of very virulent, exclusionary rhetoric that some people spout, that is dangerous. So I think a calm headed, serious debate about how to protect the rights of these people whose rights they feel are now undermined and the immigrants' rights to realize better life. So those things need to be balanced well. The wrong one does it. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yes. Introduce yourself, please. My name is Nami Kwan, and I'm from uh, Kansai University in Japan. Um, I have a question about the historical background of something. As, uh, as the introduction, uh, Princeton mentioned about the, there's some very uh, difficult issue about the historical fact between Korea and, and Japan. And it's sometimes uh, you might think it, it appears that the Japan holds very different faces as a nation that values human rights no matter, and also as a nation grappling with like various historical issues in East Asia. So for example, like in 2000, a series of uni United Nations like Security Council resolutions on women, peace, and security was adopted. And also Japanese government shows its enthusiasm for this issue. 
On the other hand, like international human rights bodies and treaty bodies have issued recommendation regulating about the military sexual slavery, as, as we call so-called convert uh, women issue. So, um, he, and also recently, like 2022, the concluding observation of the Human Rights Committee expressed regret over the lack of progress in addressing past like recommendations and continuous denial by the Japanese government. So like, it is evident that the political policies concerning historical recognition pose a significant challenge. And my question is whether there's a possibility that for the, uh, the future Japanese politics to resolve this kind of two phases gap and further promote this you know, dissemination and implementation of international human rights norms. Thank you. About, about history issue in particular. Yes. Okay. So the history issue has been a um, very, very thorny one between Japan and Korea, but also China. Um, so I've done a systematic analysis of that. I uh, haven't done it recently, but um, you know, the registrant, I, I read all the um, um, uh, editorials on OS 15. Of uh, um, every year since 1945 to 2005 or something, uh, to look at the trajectory of what I call perpetrators' trauma. So um, Japan committed crimes before 1945, right? and how how does how has that affected Japan's national psyche in reflecting on, on the past? So the upshot of that research is that uh, it is entirely true that Japan has not shown any remorse or uh, any repentant um, uh, expressions until the 1980s, right? The discourse around World War II was all about the victimhood of the Japanese people, how the Japanese suffered, military, military leaders were evil, um, and, and that, went on for decades until the 1980s. But since then, things have changed. Well, we have to, you know, Nakasone visited Yasukuni Shrine and began to blow up and China, Korea started making claims, uh, criticizing Japan, the government leaders for that. Um, and then the, in the 1990s, the issue of conflict women became huge. So Japan, if you look at the change in the discourse, uh, Japan has, the government, has, the government leaders, prime ministers, have expressed remorse, apologized a number of times already. And um, public discourse has also shifted in the direction of acknowledging victimhood of Asians right, by the Japanese military. That lasted for a little while. Right? And then, then there's some backlash. Right? There's, why are you apologizing for something that had already forgotten and is it really true what happened what's described and the some ex, uh, exaggerated claims about Japan's violation uh does it matter or not is an eye over beholder um but so so that it kind of went back and forth right and um so so we can't say that Japan has never apologized but then is it enough <laughs> When does apology become enough? Right? That really is, a, is not only in the hands of Japan. It has to be kind of a bilateral, if it's with South Korea, it's a bilateral step. And in recent years, we've seen some improvements of the relationship. It kind of goes to show how political leadership plays a big role in this kind of discourse, in this kind of debate. Uh, President Yoon is much more amenable to uh, to Jap Japanese approaches to this. Prime Minister Kishida responded to a certain extent, I think. Um, there's still these issues about forced labor and right, these court judgments are coming and the got both governments struggle to deal with them. Um, but I'm somewhat hopeful. It, it also depends on who the next leader of South Korea is. Um, but it also uh, goes to show how how past is the tool of today and the future? You look at the United States and Japan, right? Issues of atomic bombs. If US was not an ally, 
right? Japan will be hounding on that issue. It's a core of Japan's core for national identity, victimhood, the atomic bombs. And arguably, the perpetrator, right, is that, well, drop the bomb is the United States. So if US and Japan were enemies in post World War II world, then this issue would be much, much bigger. This That would be the historical problem. But it's not <clears> like that because of the relationship between Japan and the United States. So I think it really, it's in the hands of leaders of today and future. And it really depends on who the leader is in South Korea and what the Japanese leaders would do. So I think I worry a little bit about the domestic backlash in Japan, especially young people who are not educated on this topic. They don't learn too much about, I haven't followed the historical history textbooks changes anymore. Uh, Japan, Japanese sex was, used to be, it was on the trajectory of getting better in discussing those violations, but now I hear it's kind of going down. So, so both sides have to kind of come together to learn from the past. Thanks. Okay, we have many questions with quick. short time. So I'm going to go back to uh, two questions and I have one online. So let's see. Okay, too many questions. He is he happy. One here and um, one in the middle. And I do want to read off first. Jeffrey Allen online asks about the Kishida government's framework for Japanese companies to protect human rights in their supply chains. How have Japanese companies fared in the implementation of these non-binding regulatory measures, especially with respect to disclosure of human rights abuses? Hold that thought. Okay. Um this book is wonderful, and I, I really urge everyone to, to read it and look at it. But uh, the question is, in this book, you deal with three case studies, the Ainu, the Zainichi Koreans, and the Burakumi. Um, Are you going to do any more detailed case studies uh, in this approach? For example, for gay rights, for migrant rights, for disability rights? Do you have a, a plan for a, a more detailed case studies like this? Middle, introduce yourself, please. Yes. Thanks so much for your presentation. And I have a kind of abstract question about. So introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Zerling. I'm a first year RSA, Regional Studies East Asia master's student. And I have a question about you mentioned kind of media and media mobilization and empathy kind of played a role in the initial development of universal universality of human rights. Uh, and my question is kind of in Japan, I read some articles titled Kyokando Yu. Gaiko Sesaku. A Kyokan can be sympathy or empathy or like agreement. And I'm wondering how does kind of emotions or kind of empathy, the mobilization of empathy still play a role in Japanese uh, Gaiko Sesaku diplomatic you strategies? Mary, then you're going to answer all of these great questions. My question is distinct from the others. And if, if Kyo, if you can't get to it, we can talk at lunch. Um, Mary Britton, Sociology and Horatio Institute. Um, so I believe in the United Nations, but um, as we've seen over the years and, and even right now, um, it's really questionable how, um, how accountable, right? Nations, especially powerful nations, how accountable they feel to the UN um, and UN I mean, does it have any, what, what are your thoughts about its sanctioning power? Or, because I think there's an argument to be made that the UN doesn't matter, you know, on one side, right? Um, extreme view, perhaps, that, that the UN doesn't matter and what really matters is powerful states and what they want to do. Um, the other side would be, yes, of course, the UN matters because it develops the standards you know, promotes those standards. So anyway, there's there's that severe tension, I think, between powerful states, and what they want to do and what uh, the UN would like them to do. It's kind of an, perhaps an unanswerable question, but um, I wanted to hear your thoughts if there's time. So you mean, did you want to ask real quick? Yeah. Um, I have a question regarding the last sentence about how Japan could be the leader of the international Japan conference. Just in, sorry, I'm saying you mean at a first thought at the uh, US Japan program. Um, 
So you mentioned how external pressure can help the funds actually market loans, but the other way around, how do you see um, it happening? For Japan to hold accountable the Western states. Um, you mentioned how racism was one thing that Japan could have led in the interwar period, but that didn't work. How could, in the modern times, that kind of um, you know, mentor from the plan side uh, to the global uh, human rights Please. So one o'clock is it? We can go a few minutes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Five minutes to answer all of this. Uh, the, the Kishida, from the audience, uh, online audience. Um, the uh, the human rights due, due diligence and supply chain management of uh, corporations. Um, you know, Kishida government when it started it appointed Gen Nakatani san to as a assistant secretary type of position, the cabinet um, kind of position, um, specifically for human rights. And that was done with much fanfare as a recognition development that deals specifically about human rights. Um, Nakatani-san is no longer in the position, and I don't think they appointed anybody new, so that kind of disappeared. And I don't, I don't really know. Well, I don't want to say anything negative about it. <laughs> I don't see him in his office and all that. But um, not sure what's being done, what was done by that office. Um, and um, this kind of issue, the human rights due diligence, was one that. Um, Japan could have done more and can do more. It kind of relates to Japan's leadership in the international community. I've been arguing, I'm not the, I'm not the only one, for some kind of um, report. The US State, State Department issues a report on human rights situation of all the countries in the world. And people, human rights scholars often use that as a source of data in looking at human rights situations in different countries. State Department since in the 60s or 70s, I think. Um, and Japan could do the same thing with uh, um, supply chain issues in human rights. Uh, a lot of Japanese corporations are interested in doing something about it. They've done, I think it was Kei Ranren that did a survey on those companies. And a lot of corporations express interest in doing it, even commitment to do so, but they don't know what to do. They don't really know because it's hard to monitor all the small companies in Bangladesh and Indonesia and so on to manage the right, supply chain human rights violations. Um, so the government could actually expend significant resources, send some researchers. Only there are JICA people who have pretty good grasp on, on the ground. So they can assemble that data, publish every year, the kinds of um, uh, labor conditions that each country has. And that would be a guide for corporations. If, if the, some corporations realize that they're using certain factories that are seen to be problematic, they could, they could like, change the situation. But also, it also could be a, a source of information for other countries in the world, and Japan could take a leadership role in um, addressing those issues of supply chain management. So uh, the government, it, it, and it's a good step to provide some guidelines for Japanese corporations, it should actually be more of a mandatory thing, like in uh, some stock markets in Europe, in the US, I think, uh, to, to uh, disclose information, information about those issues. But, but I think really the next step could be that Japan would issue, maybe it's just focused on Asian <coughs> countries, that would be fine, because it might be hard to do it all over the world. But supply chain management issues, human rights violations in, in uh, labor rights violations in those countries, and publish a report every year, even some rate, ratings of each country. That would be a very good um, way of showing leadership in this area. Case studies, um, I haven't, I, I don't have any plan to do anything in depth, but I'll tell you about Okinawa, because a lot of people asking me about it. With Okinawa could be, people ask me, why, why aren't you including Okinawa? Well, the reason for that in for the book is that um, I was looking at country uh, groups that existed in Japan since 1945, basically. And Okinawa became part of Japan in 1972, so it didn't end up scope in terms of that time frame. Um, but aside from that, Okinawa is an interesting issue because it now it's beginning, some of the people are beginning to make the claim about 
Okinawans as an indigenous people. I think this is more out of desperation for really no recourse on resolving the uh, base issues in Okinawa. So now some of the government, governors are going to the UN human rights forums, indigenous rights forums, and, and making Governor Okinawa has, has been to those forums and made friends about Okinawa's indigenous rights. Uh, and that actually is effective because there's a lot of, in the indigenous rights forum, there's a lot of discussion about militarization of their lands. Uh, and Okinawa is really a good example of militarization. So, um, but the issue is that, um, and, and this is what I hear from Ainu activists who were not particularly happy to include Okinawa in this, in this discussion, and there's some competition for resources, so that's a little tricky. But from Ainu's point of view, Ainu is a minority group who's uh, um, suffering from discrimination and, and, and is a minority even in the, the, the place that they live in, Hokkaido. Okinawans are not minority in Okinawa. They're majority in Okinawa. And they, from an island point of view, they can express their culture more freely. Uh, they, they, so, so from their point of view, they're not suffering in the same way that Ainu is. Uh, I, I'm not gonna make any judgments on that, but uh, so that, that made it somewhat difficult for Okinawa to make claims. And also because Okinawa, in their efforts to try to return to Japan, made a strong claim in, up until the 1970s that they're Japanese. So it's kind of hard to say now that, oh, you're actually not Japanese. Right? So that, that made it difficult for some activists to jump on the court, in, even in Okinawa. But generations changed, so now I, I think they're making more claims. So, so if, if I was to do some UK study, that would be an interesting question. Um, Modernization of empathy in foreign, I'm, I'm not sure I understood the, <laughs> You said it's abstract, it is abstract. And I don't know what in what context that book talked about mm -hmm. empathy, but um, it may be related to the uh, values diplomacy, the turn to value diplomacy. And Japan has, well these days Japan talks about human rights, used to prefer the phrase human security. And now it prefers to talk about Kishida, uh, Prime Minister Kishida likes to talk about dignity. Um, I'm not sure why they're going that direction, but uh, I suppose there's some sensitivity to human rights being a not particularly popular term in the so-called global south. Mm -hmm. So the Japanese government is actually, um, again, Japan's good at being doing this engagement war and a vernacularization war. Uh, Japan's aid agencies are um, really, from what I hear, much better at understanding local needs catering to local culture uh, than Western aid agencies. So in that sense, this, this empathy, Kyokan, um, can be mobilized to make those, those delivery ways more effective. And so that's one reason why Japan doesn't always use the language of human rights. And in some contexts, uh, Jaika prefers to use the term rule of law. So they don't go in and, and, and say that, oh, we'll implement human rights. They will say, okay, we're gonna build a, a legal infrastructure in your country, right? Sometimes that's as effective and uh, a lot more acceptable to the local uh, political elites, especially. So, so that might be what you're talking about. In, in that sense, I think if Japan is moving in that direction, that could be a positive thing. Uh, well, I, I already talked a little bit, uh, oh, UN, whether UN is ever effective or not. Um, so in this, on this, it's, it's, it looks really bad today, right? <laughs> really Ukraine hard. happened and even can only, the only thing they can do is to send ICC people, International Criminal Court people to do some investigation, collect data, which is important. It will matter in the future, but it's powerless to stop what's going on right now. Yeah. Send to each other. Yeah. Um, so it looks bad, but it, it was always bad. That's, that's my tongue back is that it was never that effective. In stopping genocide, look at Rwanda, Srebrenica. Yeah, I mean, they don't have enforcement. Yes. Yes. No enforcement. Yeah. Power, right? So, so these kinds of major cases of human rights violations, United Nations has always had difficulty yeah. stopping genocide, crimes against humanity. These things are hard to stop because they it takes military intervention. Yeah. There's been some successful cases, East Timor, Libya to a certain extent. Kosovo to a certain extent. But the UN can't direct military intervention, right? 
Well, no, it's, it, it involves Chapter 7 in the Security Council and nobody vetoes, no, no, none of the five countries vetoes, then it can. And in Timor was a case where Australia took the lead, but the UN actually sent troops to prevent genocide by the militias from Indonesia. So, so there, there have been a couple of cases, but there are, there's many more series of failures in stopping these major cases. But as I said, incremental, small, uh, slow improvements, mm -hmm. that's the brand, <laughs> brand of the United Nations is to improve um, um, right situations, situations in that way. Yeah. And it's not, it's not negligible, it's actually important for people who feel the change. Mm -hmm. I knew people, I'm feeling much better today. It's not perfect, but much better than 50 years ago. And that, that, that means something. So that's what the United Nations does. Um, and Japan's leadership, um, I think we can, so I talked about this uh, you know, due diligence kind of stuff. Uh, Japan can also leverage um, the, the Hiroshima AI process or something like that to deal with uh, technology and human rights, social media, platforms and human rights violations, human rights issues there. Japan can maybe uh, do something about it. Um, issues around abortion, euthanasia, when human rights begins and ends, it's a tricky issue if it's a, an infused with religion, right? Can, Japan can play a role as a, right? Kind of secular, I mean, it's with Shinto, but it's a very secular country, so it can make some arguments about that, um, economic inequality, right? economic rights. Uh, that's also a very important issue that a lot of countries are suffering. And Japan, as much as economic inequality might be increasing, the ceiling is not that high, right? The, the, the super wealthy people, there are many more in the US, uh, even some other countries than in Japan. Japan is seen to be um, addressing some of the economic inequality issues. So maybe Japan can make Take a leadership in that issue, and uh, you know, and, and those issues have to be solved internationally. So banning tax havens, or setting a global ceiling on income, or maybe floor. I, actually, I'll be talking about floor already, right? Minimum income, but ceiling is right, something that Japan can maybe start a discussion about. So there's all kinds of um, different things that Japan can do. It's just a matter of where it might stake its claim. And uh, I think it's very important for Japan to play a role. And this is where your book is so important. And you can inspire government and yeah. citizens to take those actions. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your ideas with us.